understanding the way materials interact with tissues and organisms at the cellular and molecular levels and at a variety of different size scales is critical for advancing the development of new dental biomaterials. Surfaces and chemistries are being designed to ensure definable biological responses that lead to desirable outcomes, such as enhanced adhesion to dentin or bone for stabilization and interfacial sealing, reducing interfacial degradation mechanisms that compromise the lifetime of polymer-based dental restorations, favorable interactions with the oral microbiota that may transform a system away from dysbiosis and tissue destruction, and stimulation of new mineral formations to replace hard tissues lost due to damage or disease. Specific molecules and cells are being loaded into scaffolds of synthetic or natural materials to facilitate the complete biological regeneration of lost or damaged hard and soft tissues. And new manufacturing strategies are being developed to 3D print and biofabricate live tissue constructs and organoids. Studies describing novel means for probing this interaction between material science and biology are highlighted in a special issue of the Journal of Dental Research entitled, Interface Between Materials and Oral Biology, co-edited by myself, Jack Farrakane, and my colleague, Dr. Louise Bertassoni. The issue contains four timely critical reviews in 17 original research reports. Today, we want to highlight a couple of the articles that will appear in this special issue, each with one of their respective authors. Here is Luis Bertasoni to introduce our guest. Thanks, Jack. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. David Cohn, uh, one of the co-authors of the review article entitled Advancing Dental Innovations to the Clinic and Through Commercial Translation. Welcome, Dr. Cohn. Um, if you would, please relate to us one or two of the key components of moving uh, innovation in dental materials to commercialization. Well, thanks, Louise. Thanks, Jack, for uh, inviting me. Um, I think you ask a great question, Louise. One of the keys is understanding that it's a different ball game, and you need uh, a very different plan from a traditional academic plan. You, you need a very different plan uh, when you put on your commercialization hat. Uh, the plan is different from uh, a basic science plan. Uh, to create a translation. So the holy grail in an academic setting tends to be generating IP, uh, getting a first in human study with one's technology. But that's actually not the end point, that's the starting point uh, for, for a commercialization strategy and the way industry thinks. Uh, so the long-term goal should be clinical adoption, which means having a product having a commercialization strategy that can get a technology into a large number of patients. So the key is a different plan, and the key is integrating early and often in the process, where you need not just very strong science, but you need to understand the regulatory hurdles, you need to understand the market and what the uh, clinical population would actually be, need to understand manufacturing and scale up, uh, and you need a solid understanding of the commercial landscape and the business model and the competition. All of those are part of a plan that expands well beyond traditional uh, scientific understanding and needs. Uh, for more information, uh, I think a great uh, starting point would be the translational questionnaires that are in the appendix of our paper, particularly the first one related to medical devices, which is probably most germane to the special issue on biomaterials. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cohn, are there specific stumbling blocks that scientists frequently encounter in this process because their training is in the sciences and not so much in the development and marketing side? If so, how can this be overcome in your opinion? Yeah, another great question. And so the stumbling blocks have been uh, a buzzword used, and we refer to it in our paper, is a so-called valley of death. And I think figure one uh, highlights some of the pillars that uh, are elements of the valley of death, which makes it such that only about 5% of academic discoveries ultimately get translated to the 
in human use or uh, commercialization. So again, it requires a different plan. Uh, it requires the investigator to wear a very different hat. And I think that hat is important uh, for trainees that uh, at any level from bachelor's through postdoc that want a career in uh, industry or just for an academician who wants part of or his portfolio to be uh, in the translational sphere. So the goal is not the traditional academic goal of what's the next mechanistic experiment, what's the next uh, entity that's gonna get us to a high impact paper or a grant. The goal is really part of this translational plan, understanding the unmet clinical need, understanding the market, understanding the rigor needed to traverse the regulatory path, as well as the intellectual property of a business plan and manufacturing and scale up entities. These are traditional stumbling blocks that collectively uh, fall into the so-called valley of death. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Dr. Kohn, for these uh, helpful tips. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Vinicius Rosa, lead author of the research article entitled Graphing Nanocoding, High Quality and Stability Upon Several Stressors. Welcome, Dr. Rosa. Uh, could you tell us a little more about the rationale uh, that has been used for using graphing nanocodings for nanobiomaterials and what the outcomes have been with these surfaces uh, thus far? So, thank you, Jack and Luis, for the opportunity to talk about our work. We have been using graphene nanocoating to improve the properties of dental implants because it has very uh, promising anti-adhesive properties that can decrease the formation of biofilms and also interesting mechanical properties that promote osteogenic differentiation and also bone formation in vivo. In our most recent paper here in JDR, our team has shown that the graphene nanocoating on titanium is able to maintain high quality when challenged by a different and very stressful microenvironments making it a very promising material to improve bone formation and decrease biofilm formation on dental and prosthetic implants. That's very good. Dr. Rosa, what are the current limitations to graphene coatings on dental biomaterials and how do you see these being addressed in future work? Yeah, because of course this is a, a new technology, uh, we, we still need to develop the engineering solutions that will allow to decrease costs and uh, allow the scalability of pr the production, right? Even though nowadays we can uh, already produce uh, graphene films of 9,000 9, centi uh, centimeters square, that is quite a lot, we still need to develop a lot of uh, uh, transfer technologies that will allow us to put these graphene nanocoatings in several implants at the same time, uh, reducing the cost of for the end user and make them available for the clinicians. Very good. Thanks, Dr. Rosa, for that interesting information and explanation. Uh, the work sounds very exciting and best of luck in your continued studies. Uh, let me turn this over to Jack for some closing comments. Jack, to you. Thanks, Luis. Well, hopefully we have piqued your interest to read the articles and reviews in this special issue of the JDR and further explore this interface between materials and oral biology. Elisa and I both agree that it was a pleasure to work on this project. It's wonderful to see the hard work and innovations of so many outstanding scientists compiled into one timely and impactful issue. Thank you all for your time and interest.